was young, just uh, just finishing up college. Uh, I took my first youth pastor job at a small church plant in Huntington Beach, California. Uh, it was a, a, a church plant, didn't even have its own building. It met in a school, and I think we started with about four or five students, and I was all excited and rearing and ready to go. That's by the way, four or five students in junior high and high school combined, and uh, I was I was pretty excited. And I remember sitting down in my first ever interview for a pastor position, and there were tons of questions that they asked me, but one of the key ones that I was asked was, well, what is your vision for this ministry? And when they asked me that question, let me tell you something, as a young, immature, thinking I knew everything, I spouted off a laundry list of things that I was gonna do to make this ministry take off from our four students. One of the first things I remember saying was, you know, I, I don't see any reason we can't be one of the biggest youth ministries around in this area. Now, never mind that I was starting with four or five students and Saddleback Church was just down the way with their, you know, a couple hundred different students. But, you know, I was convinced and I talked with them about the fact that my vision was doing crazy events and high energy experiences for young people so they would have more fun than you could ever imagine. And we would build strong relationships with them and, of course, teach them about Jesus along the way. But my idea of success was shaped around this idea that we would be big and that there would be lots of people And as I look back, what I see is that the vision that I had was really all about how I defined success personally, but also how I was going to accomplish all of this with my great ideas and with my abilities, my abilities to relate to people, the giftedness God had given me to teach, that I was going to be able to pull this off. And that was the vision that I remember spouting out. It's a young, immature guy. You know, it's interesting, over the years, as I've gone through many other pastoral interviews for for different positions, you are constantly asked that same question. What's your vision for this ministry or this church? When I interviewed for the lead pastor position, having already served here at this church for eight years, I was asked the same question, Rob, what is your vision? And can I tell you that the temptation was to answer in a very similar vein? Because there's a pressure that is put on pastors and leadership within churches today to perform and to produce. And that is what is expected. Because really what we kind of seem to understand from the way that Christian culture has gone in our modern age is that when the question is asked in our modern church culture of what, what vision do you have, what people often want to know is how are you going to grow the church and get more butts in the pews? I mean, really, when you boil it down, that seems to be what people are looking for. But our understanding of success in the church, even today, has been greatly influenced by our secular culture, which tells us that the more people, the more money, the more popular you are, the more successful you are. But I want you to think about what has transpired in our culture over the last many years as this type of mentality has taken root in God's church. We have moved often in the church today towards an entertainment style culture. We wanna give people when they come to church an experience that will make them feel good about themselves so that when they walk out the door, they will want to walk back in the next week. And this entertainment driven culture oftentimes finds itself being grounded in the fact that people in the church want to draw a large crowd that makes them feel as though they have been successful. And so often the pressure that pastors will face is catering to people to make them feel comfortable, to make them happy, to try to come up with the next big or great idea so that people will want to stay and you can define success. But let me ask this question. Where has that gotten the church in our modern culture today? Statistics show that church attendance is on severe decline in all of America that people in the church today are leaving because for many different reasons. And as you look at it, one of the things that you will find that they say often is that the reason is that they don't find that the church is actually making a difference in their lives. Many people also find that the church isn't necessarily making a difference in the lives of other people. Oftentimes, people will use words like the church feels superficial or empty or not fulfilling And everything that happens seems as though it can be explained by human ingenuity rather than by being explained by the power of God moving through his people and his church. I want you to understand this. 
When we build the church around secular definitions of success and our own methods and great ideas that are meant simply just to draw a lot of people in the doors, we will often sacrifice something of what God actually intended for his church. And what is often sacrificed is a true experience of the transforming power of God moving through his people when their lives are wholly submitted to him. And so let me ask you this question this morning. What, let me flip the table if you will. What is the vision and mission of the church? How is it that we are to understand God's purposes for us as his collective body? How is it that we answer this question? What I love is that God has not left us in the dark. When we get into God's word and we read his word, we spell out, we see that he has spelled out so clearly for us how it is that we can understand what the vision and mission is for the church, but what that means is for our individual lives. And over the next many weeks, throughout the winter months, we're gonna be going through a series together in the book of Acts, talking about the mission of the church. What is it that God has called us to? We're gonna take a look at the very beginning of the church in the book of Acts. And what I love is that this is an incredible story that is being told by Luke. Luke is painting for us a, a super, super clear picture of what God intends for his church. It's full of drama and intrigue. It's full of pain and sadness. It's full of uh, danger and riveting stories of supernatural events. But what's more important, what I love is that as Luke tells this story, he paints for us a very clear picture of the plan, the purpose, and the power that God intended for his church to experience. And I wanna bring that down to a very personal level for you. What Luke intends as he writes us and what God has intended as we read through the book of Acts is that we would understand his plan, his purpose, and his power for each of us as individuals as we collectively come together as his body to worship him and to be a part of his kingdom purposes in this world. And so as we begin in this series together this morning, I want you to take a look with me uh, at Acts chapter one. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me as well. If you have your sermon notes, I'd encourage you to pull those out and to follow along. But we are gonna begin as we do in the book of Acts at the chapter one, beginning in verse one. I'm gonna read here first, Acts chapter one, verses one through five. And what I want us to do as we begin this series is to unpack the plan that we see that is being detailed here. Not just Luke's plan for writing this passage, but God's plan that he is revealing throughout this book. And so if you have your Bibles, let's take a look together at Acts chapter one and we'll begin by reading just verses one through five. It says this, and in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day where he was taken up and after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As we take a look at the beginning of Acts chapter one, what I really want us to do is unpack a little bit of the plan. And to do that, I wanna step back and kind of look at the players that we see right here up front and what is actually taking place with the writing of this book. So let's get a little bit of detail and background. Letter A, who is Luke? I want us to have an understanding of who Luke was. Luke was a close friend and a traveling companion of Paul, as we see in the book of Acts. There are many passages where you will see, they call them the we passages, we passages, where Luke doesn't necessarily address himself in the first person, but as he is talking about Paul and his missionary journeys and the many things that are happening, Luke will say things like, we went here, or we did this, or this is what we experienced. And as he does, 
does that, he shares with the reader to help you to understand that he was a close companion of Paul. He was an occasional participant with him in his missionary journeys as they spread the gospel throughout Europe. He was also, it appears from the book of Acts, it appears that Luke was with Paul even during his imprisonment in Rome. In other words, he's writing from a very firsthand encounter and experience of what was taking place in the early church. We also understand that Luke was a physician. And in Colossians chapter four, verse 14, Paul, as he's speaking to the church in Colossae, says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. And so we understand that not only was he a close companion of Paul, he was also a physician. But what we see from his writings is that Luke was also a historian. And what we understand, not only from the book of Acts, but we also see in the Gospels, is that Luke also authored the Gospel by his name, the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts, both of these two together. And I think this is important for us, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, understanding how Luke wrote the history of Jesus' ministry and the history of the early church and how they are connected. And so we'll touch on that here in just a minute. But what we understand is this also about Luke. He was most undoubtedly a second generation Christian. In Luke chapter one, verse two, in his gospel, he makes the statement that he was not personally involved in Jesus's ministry, but who, but he was, he did have contact with those who were firsthand eyewitnesses and that he was a servant of the word. And so he is writing from personal experience and acts, but also from his personal relationships that he had with the disciples and those who were eyewitnesses, those who experienced all that Jesus did in the gospel of Luke. Now, letter B, what we see as we begin in the book of Acts is he says in the first book, speaking of the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, he says, oh, Theophilus, let her be, who is Theophilus? The, the truth is, is that uh, scholars have debated this for a long time. There isn't much in the text or in the Bible that helps us to have an understanding of who Theophilus was. However, when we look in Luke chapter one, we see that he is also writing to Theophilus. And what he does is he gives him and speaks to him using a title and, and calling him most excellent Theophilus. Many scholars believe that Theophilus was most likely some sort of Roman official because this title was one that was used for provincial governors, someone who maybe had a high rank in Rome. Other, other commentators and other scholars believe that there was a potential that Theophilus was a wealthy benefactor, maybe someone who was financially supporting Luke's travels as he went around and he met with people to make sure that he got the story correct in his writings. We know that Theophilus' name in Greek means a friend of God or a lover of God. And we also see in Luke's writings that Theophilus was someone who needed clarification and assurance about the understanding of Christianity that he had been taught and had received so far. Many other people also believe that Luke presumably hoped that Theophilus, as he was impacted by the gospel message, would be someone who would act as a patron or a sponsor in taking these written works, these histories, to a much greater audience and so thereby spreading the gospel message. Now, letter C, as we understand who Luke and Theophilus were, what we also see in the writing is that the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were undoubtedly meant to be connected to one another. When we look at the book of Luke, we see that it was actually, again, intended for Theophilus. He says in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all, the, all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. And so what Luke does here is he writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts as a historian, using incredible detail, but his hist historical detail that he writes with is the vehicle that he's using for theological interpretation. And what we see as we read the book of Luke is that one of Luke's major concerns is to show that the work, passion, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus are the fulfillment of prophecy, that literally Jesus is the Messiah. And 
as he writes, he wants everybody to understand that Jesus is the Messiah that was sent to his people. And so he gives us great detail from the very beginning of Jesus' life, from his birth. And when we went through the Christmas season and you read that story in the book of Luke, he uses such incredible detail to help us understand that. We see it in his ministry and his suffering and his death and his resurrection. And even at the end of the book of Luke, when he speaks and writes about the ascension. But what's important to understand is that Luke, when he writes the book of Acts, picks up exactly exactly where he left off with his gospel. The opening verses of Acts suggest to us that Luke is about to narrate what Jesus was going to continue to do and teach after his ascension through the power of the Holy Spirit, but also through the ministry of his disciples and his church. The connection here is so strong between the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts that some people have actually wondered why the Bible wasn't ordered differently. You know, now it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Well, why didn't they do Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts? It seems like that would make the most sense. And as many scholars have studied, and I have studied myself, I will tell you, I believe the reason is that nobody has any idea. Um, <laughs> There is no good answer why they didn't do that, but make no mistake, these books were written in such a way as to flow from one to the other. There are 28 chapters in the book of Luke that detail for us the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, there are 28 chapters that detail for us the early church movement and spread of the gospel. What we have in the book of Luke is 30 years of Jesus's life. What we have in the book of Acts is 30 years of history of the beginning of the church and the spread of the gospel. What we understand is that the plan for Luke was to tell the whole story. But letter D, what Luke does is he skillfully preserves the beginning of God's plan of redemption. Luke's plan under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was to give a detailed account of Jesus's life and teachings. Luke's plan was also to give a clear picture of the beginning of the early church and the spread of the gospel. We see that Luke's plan from how he writes at the beginning of his books was to give certainty to other people concerning what they had been taught already, people like Theophilus. But as well, what we understand to an even greater degree is that Luke wrote to reveal with crystal clear clarity God's plan for his people. And that plan is the redemption of the world through the person and work of Jesus Christ, but also secondarily through his church in the church age. God's plan wasn't to draw big crowds. It wasn't to be popular. It wasn't to be successful in the world's eyes. God's plan was to save the world through Jesus Christ. It's the reason as a church that when we talk about what is our plan and what is the vision that we have as a church, our mission is to lead people into growing relationship with Jesus Christ because that is what God has revealed have been his purposes from the very beginning of time. And this is how Luke moves us, not only through his gospel, but also through the book of Acts. What I'd like us to do is not only now to understand the ultimate plan, but what is God's purpose for his people within that plan to do that? I want you to look with me at Acts chapter one, beginning in verses six through 11. Acts chapter one, verses six through 11. And here we will grasp God's purposes. Verse six says this. So when they, the disciples, (coughs) had come together, they asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand here looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Think about this incredible thing that is happening that Luke details for us. Jesus has died, he has resurrected, he has appeared, he has been teaching his disciples about the kingdom. It tells us here that he is meeting with them. It seems for this final time and after giving them some very important important instruction about the purpose that he has planned for them. He is lifted up right in front of them and ascends into heaven, disappears. And the disciples must have been standing there scratching their head going, never seen something like this before, not sure what to do. And then the passage tells us two guys in white robes, most presumably angels, show up and say, what are you guys doing? He's given you a call. He's given you a purpose. He's given you direction. Go, because you got work to do because one day he is going to come again. And so be busy until he comes again. And what I want us to do as we look at this passage in verses six through 11, I want us to grasp God's purpose as he revealed it to his disciples. To do that, I wanna make three observations. Letter A, observation number one. What we see as we read through this is that the disciples still don't completely get it. They don't quite get what's going on. The question that they ask him is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Most of us, when we read this, think, is this some kind of like dense question? Are they not understanding what Jesus has been teaching them all these years? I mean, it seems like he's given pretty clear instruction. When I worked at McDonald's, one of the best jobs I ever had, lie, Um, horrible. When I worked at McDonald's, there was this uh, uh, person that was employed there with me at the same time. And and their first week of work, uh, the first place they stick you is working the fry station. So you can go home smelling really bad and have lots of zits. And uh, so he's sitting there and he's working. But the only instruction you're given is make fries, put them in cartons, set them there. But then keep the fry station clean. I mean, you're pouring salt in that thing constantly. It gets gummed up with just tons of salt granules. I was watching the manager that was on shift with me, kept looking at this other employee and was going, could you please keep that thing clean? It is horribly dirty. People are going to see that. They're not going to want to eat from that. And so this employee kept going and grabbing the glass cleaner because the station had glass on its sides and was spraying it and cleaning the glass, profusely cleaning, like shining it. The best they possibly could. It took six, seven, eight times for my manager to look at this individual and go, would you please clean the station? He's like, I am cleaning it. And he's just kept cleaning the glass while it looked horrible on the inside. Finally, the manager in his frustration comes running up and he grabs a towel and he starts scraping out all the salt out of this thing and how disgusting it was. He goes, this, my friend, is how you clean it. Are you dense? And he was sitting there making fun of him, looking at him. By the way, I was that employee. But anyway, um, (laughs) but uh, hey, I'm a little slow, okay? You would think that after the disciples had received all of this instruction from Jesus, it tells us that after his resurrection, he was with them for a long period of time, teaching them about the kingdom. You would think that they had finally figured it out, and some people have even suggested that the question they ask about, is this the time you're gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? You would think, because we wanna accuse the disciples of being a little dense, you would think that their question was misguided. But you gotta understand something. The question wasn't misguided. The disciples had their own political agenda from the beginning. But it was based upon the scriptures. They believed that Israel would be returned to former glory by the Messiah, returned to days like when King David ruled over the nation, that they would be in a position of power even over other nations, not under the foot of somebody else. But they had this understanding because it's what scripture taught. And since there was standing in front of them a resurrected Messiah speaking with them about the kingdom, they knew of absolutely no reason that the earthly form of the kingdom could not be set up immediately. But here's observation number two. What Jesus helps them to understand is the plan is still unfolding. It is not time for that to happen. The response that he gives to them as they ask this question is this, it is not for you to know the times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. I want you to notice what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't tell them that they are wrong about the restoration of Israel. 
He, you would think that if they were wrong, he would have corrected them immediately. Anybody here a backseat driver? Come on, confess. Anybody? I see spouses looking at each other, selling you out, okay? Now, I, I can be a backseat driver, and I'll tell you what, when I was in uh, high school, I was most definitely a backseat driver. I love to tell people how to drive. I remember one instance in particular when uh, we were on a, going on a retreat with our youth pastor. We were driving uh, down a freeway, and all of us in the church van, as he was driving, were looking at him going, hey, you're going the wrong direction. This doesn't look right. And he would not listen to us. He just kept driving. He's like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Be quiet. Of course, this is before the days of GPS, and when you just have a map, and we're like, No, we're pretty sure you're supposed to turn. He kept going an hour and a half in the wrong direction on this trip. And we just kept saying, come on, would you listen, right? Until he finally realized, pulled off and had to eat some serious crow at at the hands of some, some young high school students. See, the thing is, is that when we recognize that somebody is going in the wrong direction, what do we typically do? We correct them. We tell them to reverse course. We plead with them to move in the right direction. Notice that Jesus doesn't do this with the disciples. He doesn't deny their expectation of a literal earthly kingdom of Israel that that would eventually be set up. If they were mistaken, you would think that at such a crucial point in his kingdom teaching and right before he is going to ascend into heaven and leave them to carry out his work, that he undoubtedly would have corrected them. This is something that would have been essential for them to understand. But rather, what does Jesus do? He redirects them. He tells them, it's not for you to know the time that this will happen. And then he focuses them on the purpose at hand, the continuation of the plan and the fulfillment of their purpose within it. Letter C, observation number three, what Jesus does here, God clearly declares his purpose for his followers when he says to them, you are to be my witnesses. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, uh, you guys understand what a witness is, correct? Anybody ever here been a witness to an event? Uh, right before Christmas, as I was taking Garrett to a baseball practice, there was a car accident that happened right in front of us. As we were driving up Brent Road, coming up on uh, Centennial, this car was going to turn left and this other car was doing like 50, just blazed through and nailed the front end of this other car. I mean, it was, it was pretty incredible. And um, I took Garrett to practice and then I came back because I knew I had seen the whole thing. I wanna make sure people were okay, but also that you know, if they needed any kind of witnesses, the police were there and the police officer walks up to me and what is it that he asked me? He wanted to know as a witness what I saw. He wanted to know what I heard, but also what I felt felt? Did, who, who did I think was at fault because of what had taken place? What we understand is that a witness is a person who sees or who has personal knowledge of something, not a second-hand account, but someone who has a direct account. And what Jesus is telling his disciples here is this, as he looks at them and he says, you have witnessed everything firsthand. You have walked with me. I have changed your life when I called you and you followed me. You have been a part of witnessing the miracles of God's power moving through my life. You have been present with me as I have taught you about God's kingdom. As you have come to the understanding that I am the Messiah, the one chosen by God to be sent to you for the salvation of the world. You have all of this knowledge and experience firsthand. My purpose for you is that you would now go and tell other people what you have seen, what you have heard, and what you have experienced so that other people would find salvation which is found in me alone, beginning in Jerusalem and moving throughout the entire world, touching every single life. And as we look at this purpose that God, that Jesus explains to his disciples, it helps us to understand our purpose today. And I hope that you see that. I want us to draw some principles out of this passage for us to understand the application for our lives. Understanding our purpose today, letter A, I want you to understand that you are a continuation of God's plan of redemption in the same way that the disciples were a continuation of that plan. Through his work in your life, you are a continuation of the story that God has been unfolding throughout all of history, throughout all of scripture to bring salvation to the world. I want you to think about how incredible the story is. In AD 30, Jesus died, raised from the dead, commissioned his disciples, and then ascended into heaven. 
50 days after the resurrection, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that whole, the Holy Spirit empowered his disciples and that they went out and they followed the purposes that he gave to them. And they began to share in his strength and his power what they had witnessed and people began to come to Jesus Christ. Literally, the church was born. What we see in the book of Acts is that Peter preaches his first sermon. It says that 3,000 people were added to their number in that moment through the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. Peter and John continue to preach, continue to do miracles. And the Bible tells us that over 5,000 people more were added to their number. As we continue in the story in AD 31, Stephen was stoned, becoming the first martyr of the church. But again, this martyrdom only served to continue to thrust the gospel message forward. Because in AD 31, we see that Saul, who stood there giving approval to Stephen's stoning, has an encounter as a person who was, was responsible for murdering numerous Christians and having them murdered. God confronts Saul and transforms his life, gives him a new name of Paul and says, you are mine, young man, and you are going to be a, about my purposes in taking the gospel message of Jesus to the rest of the world. He transforms his life. And through 28 chapters of Acts, we see numerous missionary journeys where Paul is going out and spreading the gospel all throughout Europe. By AD 80, the gospel reached France and Tunisia. 20 years later, we see that the first Christians are reported in Algeria and Sri Lanka. Over the next couple hundreds of years, the gospel continued to spread all throughout Europe and even in Africa. In AD 595, Augustine and a bunch of missionaries, where it says in their first year of ministry in England, over 10,000 people were baptized and came to faith in Jesus Christ. In AD 6 35, the first missionaries reached China. In AD 1200, we see that there were 22 different languages that the Bible had been written in. In 1607, settlers came to Jamestown here in the United States and brought with them the good news of Jesus. In the early 1700s, the rise of the Great Awakening in our country was a revival that was stirred by people like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And in 1865, because of this movement of the Spirit, A.B. Simpson accepted and took his first pastorate in Canada. Later, a few years later in 1897, the Christian Missionary Alliance was born through A.B. Simpson's missionary, a worldwide mission sending organization who believed that the ultimate goal of the church was to take the good news of the gospel so the, through the whole world so that Jesus would come again. And then in the early 1900s, A.B. Simpson sent a young woman, an evangelist, Cora Rudy, to the area of Toledo, sent by Simpson to start churches so that the gospel would spread in this area. And in 1908, because of her ministry, the Toledo Gospel Chapel, Westgate Chapel today, was born. And for over 111 years, Westgate Chapel has been all about leading people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ in the Toledo area and by sending missionaries all throughout the world because we believe that the purpose purpose and plan that God has given us is to take the good news of the redemption that is through Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. And we are a part of the story. Amen. The message of the gospel has spread from the time of Acts chapter one, all the way to today. And you are a part of that story. You are a part of the plan and the continuation of God's plan to take the gospel message to those who don't know him so that they would find salvation. Let her be following God, our purpose today. Following God means that you are devoted to his purposes. But I want you to understand, just because we in the church or even in our own lives may have a rich history of having experiences with God and seeing him do incredible things, it doesn't mean that God is done with us yet. It doesn't matter how short or how long you have been a follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how young or even how old you may be. We said that as we went through the unfinished initiative together as a church and the way that Paul said to the church in Philippi that we believe these words that Paul speaks that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We believe with all of our hearts because of the testimony of God's word that there is more that God wants to do in us but also that God desires to do through us in bringing men to salvation until the day that Jesus returns. What does the angel say to them? Go get busy because one day he's coming again. Church, 
Our work is not finished until the day that Jesus comes again. And the purpose that he has put on our lives and heart is to take the witness that we have received of how he has transformed our lives and to share it with a world that needs to know him. God's purpose, letter C, for you as his follower is number one, to be a devoted worshiper. First Peter 3.15 says, sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. This word sanctify means to set apart Christ as holy. In other words, when we sanctify Christ as the Lord of our hearts, he is our primary affection. He is the one that we love. He is the one that we center our lives around. He is why This is why as a church at Westgate Chapel that we focus on teaching God's word is because we believe that as we understand who God is and his plan and his purpose for our lives, it truly allows us to live as devoted worshipers of the one true king. And we desperately in this world and culture today need to get back to understanding what it means to truly follow Jesus. Not to go to church so that we can be entertained or feel good about ourselves or somehow think that we're earning credits towards heaven. What we need to understand is that the reason that we gather together in his church and focus on the teaching of his word is so that we would truly be devoted, that he would be the center place of all of our affection, that everything we do in our lives would flow from the love that he has for us and that we have for him. And the question I wanna ask you this morning is this, is have you sanctified Christ as the Lord of your life? Because this is the primary responsibility for anyone who would follow Jesus Christ. Have you set him apart as the one who, re- who receives your primary affection? Have you set him apart as the one who guides every part of your life and every decision that you make? Have you put yourself in positions and situations even within his church to continue to grow, to be challenged and to surrender more of who you are to him and to be a part of his mission? This is what it looks like to be a devoted worshiper. As well, number two, our purpose is to be devoted witnesses. We ourselves are those who have seen and heard and experienced God's work in our lives in so many different ways. From the time I was young and God called me to a place of salvation throughout my life, I have seen him work in so many ways, changing my life and changing the lives of other people. I've seen him work miraculously. I have seen him answer prayer. And it reminds me of the words of 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, where John says this. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld with our hand and our ha- what we have what we behold and what our hands handled concerning the word of life, we have seen and we bear witness and we proclaim to you. The call that we have is to take how our experience of God has transformed our lives and to be a witness of it to other people in this world. And yet why is it today that it is often that Christians don't take this call seriously? It was Francis Chan who said, I think so clearly and in such a great way. When Simon says, pat your head, pat your head, right? We pat our heads. When Simon says, rub your belly, what do you do? You rub your belly. When Simon says to do something stupid, like run around in a circle and bark like a dog, what do you do? You run around in a circle and you bark like a dog. But when Jesus says to be my witnesses and go make disciples, we're really good at memorizing the verse. Why is it, church, that we don't understand that that verse wasn't there just for us to memorize? that it was a commission and a call that God has placed on our lives to be a part of his plan, to live our lives with purpose, to share our story with other people so that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. If we're going to fulfill our purpose as Christ followers and reach the lost world with the good news of the gospel, then we must take seriously God's call on our lives to not only sanctify Christ as the Lord of our hearts, the one who has our primary affection from which everything in our lives flow, but as 1 Peter 3.15, says that we must also always be prepared to give an answer, to give a witness for those who have, for, to others for the hope that we have. And my question and challenge for you today is how are you allowing God to use you as his witness to other people? Have you devoted yourself to this purpose that he has for your life as his follower and for us collectively together as his church? Finally, number three, 
God's purpose for us as his followers is to be devoted worshipers, to be devoted in our witness to others, but to be devoted disciple makers. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, we see the words again that Jesus speaks to his disciples as he makes clear their purpose to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end when I come again. Powerful. My friends, we celebrate communion here together today because we are recognizing the work that God has accomplished on our behalf through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In it, we see the depth of his love for us and the depth of his love for the world. In it, we recognize the witness that we have that we are all sinners undeserving of God's grace and yet he so graciously has given everything to restore us in relationship to God so that we can be his children united together with him but then on on mission with him in this world, telling people the good news of his son, Jesus. As we come to this table today, I want us to take time to reflect and to understand that right here is where our deepest affection must lie as a church in who Jesus is and in what he accomplished because it is this that pushes us in our hearts to be devoted to going and to sharing how he has transformed us through his son.